Welcome to What is Next. Today, What is Next is coming from Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, KNUST Kumasi, and specifically, we are coming from the Department of Planning, where the focus of that department is delivering excellent planning education for the people of this department for the nation Ghana. And my guest is Professor Kwesi Kwafo Adakwa, a former vice chancellor of KNUST and himself a professor of the department. I'm talking about Professor Kwesi Kwafo Adakwa. Prof, welcome to What is Next. We are much. so grateful that you've accepted to be with us. My pleasure. Prof, is there a direct relationship between planning and national development? Yes, there is a direct relationship between planning and national development. As you and I are aware, things don't just happen by chance. We need to sit down, put our efforts together, look at our resources, look at what we can do, look at our comparative advantage, and then input this into our programs. And therefore, without planning, there can be no national development. And that is why there's a direct link between planning and national development. Viewers, we just want to take a break. If you have the time, wait for us. We'll come back very soon. This is what is next. May the Araba clean. May Pau Chewu. Sawuko Baby Suba. Woho Gro Wonsa. Woko di Agro Via. Woho Gro Wonsa. Na wose sa wo bano napi. Ana diapes no vien sue. Wede wonsa to a young consum. Echiano via. Woho Gro. Enti a ya. Woho Gro Wonsa ye pa and sana one wa we biani. Anansu ube didi. Woho Gro Wonsa. And sa yang ho hoo yen, mwa mwa wan kitin kitia, yen fa ye ni en huon, e ba shi sha hon, sa mwa mwa wei, e tu mi kwa shewe bia ni mwa, e tu mi di ya dia ebreo. Sa wu di e bia ni a sa jem si a dori mwa, u be ti mi enya cholera, e ni diarrhea. Fa sa me na ho hoo wan sa, ho hoo nwa tun su ya, e soni yo a se, ho hoo wan sa yam, e ni wo mwa yuri mu, wo nsa e chi, wo nsa e duya, e ni wa bakon. Kai, na ho hoo wan sa ye, Abra wako ejanan bia so aba wako di agro ewie ansana ubenwa eduane ansana ubedidi nempo wachiachi amkrofo ewie no kai na ohro won sayi enye na mawei enye usuban ohro won sa bra no bra no meho nti enye kama na enya ho den welcome to what is next what is Next is a very educative program on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. It's a program that is asking questions about contemporary challenges confronting us as a nation and seeking relevant answers from people we consider to have accumulated wisdom, people who are thought leaders of our country at the moment. Now in scripture, in Proverbs chapter 21 verse 5, it says that, Diligent and good planning will always result in prosperity and success. And those who rush into things, short uh, uh, cut, will always end up in poverty. When you come to this country, Ghana, the face of planning, architecture, building technology is Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. And today we are discussing strategic planning and nation building. And we want to go to KNUST and find some relevant uh, answers as to what do we need to do as a people. And thank God we have a professor in the planning department, himself also a former vice chancellor of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, to help us answer some of the questions confronting us at the moment when it comes to planning and national development. The man I'm talking about is Professor Kwesi Kwafo. Adakwa. Prof, welcome to What is Next. Thank you very much. We know you are a very busy person, but we are so grateful you've made time to be with us. Now, Prof, we have all known you as Prof. Adakwa, but help my audience to know a little bit of you. Who is Prof. Kwesi Kwafo Adakwa? Thank you very much. Um, as you said, I'm 
Kwesi Kwafu Adakwa. Um, I was born on the 16th of December 1951 in Aburi, in the Eastern Region. I started my basic education at the Police Depot Primary School, just behind the Ghana Technology University. Uh, went to Koforidua, uh, finally to the Presby Boys Boarding School in Aburi, from where I went to Mfan Swim School, uh, following which I came to the KNUST, at the time it was called UST, for the undergraduate studies. I did my postgraduate studies initially at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. And I had a terminal degree from Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan. And since then, I've been here working for several years. Following my working life here, I've, uh, God has been so good to me. I've earned the fellowship of several professional organizations. Um, I'm a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. I'm a fellow of the Ghana Institute of Planners. I'm also a fellow of the Ghana Institute of Logistics and Transport. And thankfully, I was also I was awarded the Order of the Volta Officer Division. So that's, in short, who I am. Prof, people see some of you as very successful in your fields of endeavor, but are there values that have kept you, whether in your personal life, in the area of academic, what are some values that have kept you, values that you don't want to do away with? Thank you. Uh, the first one would be primarily the fear of God. This was put into me very early in my, 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 my childhood days. We're also talking about modesty. It's also very important. It's scriptural, but I think it's important that in everything we do, we are modest. Transparency is another another uh, another value that was inculcated in me several years ago, and truthfulness. So, in a sense, these are some of the core values I've treasured since my childhood, and I want to believe that I still, or they still guide me in whatever I do. Yeah, but are there one or two people that you consider as your mentors, people that in public you even want to acknowledge who have had influence in your life? Uh, initially, when I was very young, I lived in the police barracks, and therefore, naturally, my horizon was very limited. I saw the commanding officers um, as one of some of my mentors, because there was nowhere else to go. We were just in the barracks. But following several years, uh, when I began to grow, when I began to have more education, what happened was that I had a wider horizon, and therefore, I began to see people who were working in the UN, those who were professionals in the field. And indeed, um, the horizon widened. So every day, day in and day out, um, I, I was introduced to a few people, either directly or indirectly through books that I read or through movies and so on and so forth. So since then, I fought a number of them. One of them was my uncle who worked with the United Nations. He rose to be the chief of the East African Division in, at the UNDP headquarters in Accra. I saw him as somebody who was successful. He held onto all the values that I've mentioned, and therefore he became my model. But here at KNUSC, a few people um, also influenced my life. Um, I'm particularly referring to Professor E.K. E. E. Tamaklo, um, Professor Austin Tete, Mr. Dudonko, and several others. So these are the people we looked up to until we left the undergraduate program. Uh, following that, I think that I've kept my horizon even higher, and therefore I see a lot of other people. But primarily, because of the education, my education, I was limited again to those that I knew as my teachers. Now, Prof, is there a direct relationship between planning and national development? Yes, I think there's a direct relationship between planning and national development. If you go back carefully and you look at what planning is or is supposed to be, Simply put, it helps us organize our future activities in the most efficient way, most economic way, and the most convenient way. This being said, then what it means is that if we are to progress, then we need to make conscious effort. The conscious effort will be for us to have a group of people who put together our thoughts uh, and then try and coordinate them. Once we can do this, then we'll see that there will be a direct relationship between planning and national development. Indeed, if you look at this question again, what happens in the absence of planning? There will be chaos, total chaos. 
And that is why planning is very, very important to national development. And the two are related closely. Is it not enough to say planning instead of saying strategic planning? No. I think when you prefix planning with some other words, then you are simply describing the details or, the, if you would, the subspecialization. If you look at uh, strategic planning, the origin is from the corporate world. Uh, we saw enterprises that, were, that had been downsized, some had merged, and so on and so forth. And the idea was to get, put their synergies together so they become more productive and more profitable. And that is why we started, well, we described that kind of planning as strategic planning. But these days, we've, got, we've all gone overboard. Churches are doing strategic planning, institutions are doing strategic planning, and so on and so forth. So planning is not sufficient if you want to do go further and describe the detail, the strand of planning that you are concerned with. And so I think that we'll look at planning as a generic term, and then for each of the strands of the activities we are involved in, we can prefix the word planning with those types of activities. And therefore, for example, you can have education planning, health planning, transport planning, and so on and so forth. So to preface planning means that you are bent on describing the subspecialization in detail. Now, the impression out there is planning is for people like you, Institute of Planners, professionals like you. But who must plan? Okay. Um, what you're saying is right. Several years ago, that used to be the philosophy of planning. But since now, it's changed. Now, what it means is that anybody who's going to be impacted, either positively or negatively, should have a say in the process. And therefore, we can look at all beneficiaries as contributing to the planning process. But that being said, we also need a group of people to put this together to make sure that maximum synergies result. And that is why we have a group that we call professional planners. But generally, everybody who lives in a community or who lives in a household, who lives in a community, in a district, uh, in a nation, has a direct input to planning. And planning benefits everybody. And, and at what point should an individual or society plan? If I'm in a comfortable state, if I don't have problem, should I plan? Or should I plan only when I'm confronted with challenges? At what point should planning be an issue? Every day of your life. If you look at your life cycle, uh, before you were born, people had to plan for you. And during your lifetime, when you become of age, you plan yourself. And if you're following that, people have to plan or plan very well to see you off. And so throughout life, everybody plans, especially the way, the, what you said. When you are comfortable and you don't plan, very soon your resources, your resources will be exhausted and you'll be in difficulty. So whether you are rich, whether you are poor, whether you live in the southern part of Ghana, northern part of Ghana, eastern part of Ghana, or western part of Ghana, we all need to plan because resources are limited. If you don't do that, we'll exhaust our resources in no time. Now, sometimes you hear short-term, medium-term, long-term in planning efforts. Yeah. Prof, do they really, really mean anything? They, 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 they mean a lot. You see, I've said that resources are limited. If we had unlimited resources, then we could get together and within one day we could award 92 contracts to people to start building a town. But that's not the case. And therefore we have something we, we call priorities. So we have to prioritize our needs and our wants. And that in planning terms, that is how come we have short term, medium term, long term. When you talk about short term, primarily you're talking about within the next two years, something that will happen within the next two years. That will be constituted short term. The medium term would be something up to five years from now. Anything beyond five years technically constitutes a long term. And therefore, you, I'm sure you've heard about long term plans, medium term plans, and short term plans. That being the case, perhaps it's also important to know that you cannot have a one year or two year strategic plan. That is, that is, that, that is the differentiation between them. And the times are very important, as I said, because of priorities. Viewers, this is what is next on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of uh, the country. And I'm in conversation with Professor Kwesi Kwafo Adakwa, former Vice Chancellor, Kwame Nkrumah University, 
of science and technology. And we are reflecting on strategic planning and national development. Prof, a visit to our communities does not give impression of strategic planning, whether short term, medium, long term. It is like a matter of what people can afford. Now you don't have place for cemetery, schools, market. Those who can afford situate school cemeteries where they can afford to acquire the land. This is what is happening in our communities in the district. People now acquire land in, in settlements anywhere and they turn it to cemeteries. So where is this uh, short term, medium term, long term planning in our communities in the districts? Let, let me start off by making a few things clear. When you talk about land, we are actually talking about a commodity which is sold. But selling the commodity is very different from using the commodity. What we do as planners has always been to determine the use to which the land will be put, must be put. But here we are, in our part of the world, it appears as if every time we plan, we need to back it with power and politics. What we see happening in Ghana is that we have rationality competing with politics and power. We do our work rationality with, competing with, with politics and power. In the sense that when you've done all your planning, which is based on sound rational principles, then the politician or whoever has the power can determine that, look, to hell with you, or look, we're not going to follow your plan. And you know too well in Ghana that once you want to do the right thing, uh, they are going to point out to you and say that, well, when it gets to the end of the four-year cycle, we'll see. You know what I mean? And that is why we think that the chaos we see there is not a failure of state, but a failure of the institutions that are responsible for ensuring that the land or the parcels of land are put to designated uses. And therefore, when you go to the areas you mentioned, we can see right away that there's been a failure. The institutions have been overwhelmed with the problems and therefore everybody does what he or she wants. Take the case of Agbaboshi. Take the case of Sawaba in Kumasi and so on and so forth. It's a clear demonstration that our capacities and the financial capacities are limited and therefore people have to do what they think is right or to make them egg living. And that is why we see a lot of these things all around. Can you imagine people living in cardboard houses? They just cannot afford it, as you said. And if you are unable to afford it, it doesn't mean that planning is not important. Planning is important, except that the institution has failed you, not the planning institution, the implementing institution has failed you, and therefore what you see would be your natural reaction to the failures that the system has generated. And that is why we see all these things happening. Again, now it is the informal settlements that at the moment offer low-cost housing to the urban poor in Ghana. The well-developed housing plans of government that we've heard over the years, affordable housing projects, seriously benefit the rich. Well, in a sense, you may be right. You may be right. But generally, all the houses we see, uh, in the University, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, a lot of work has been done. Uh, we've developed materials which can bring down the housing quality and so on and so forth. But here you are, again, co within the cultural context, a lot of us do not want to experiment with anything at all because we're going to use our lifetime investment in putting up a structure. And therefore, if you tell me I should use land crate, for example, and plaster the sites, I probably would not agree with you. And that is why perhaps you can now say that a lot of us do not want to use do not want to use alternative building materials. The fact is that they are durable, they can serve the same purpose. But because you have all your lifetime investments in a house, you want to make sure that the lifespan is guaranteed. Otherwise, with a small a little flood here and there, the building might lose its stability. So that or its integrity, and that is why most of us think that, or most Ghanaians think the way we think. But it's also not right to say that the low-cost houses are meant only for the rich. They are targeted. In fact, what we need to do now is to target. So, if you earn a certain income, it's up to us now, the professionals, to ensure that with your income over the next three or five years, you could have 
a bit of some housing that will suit your income. You've recently heard that in Asakore Mampong, for example, they have developed the low cost houses, which Professor, uh, sorry, uh, President Kufu started. And we're told that an efficiency apartment, efficiency meaning that there's just one space where you have the kitchen, the living room, and so on and so on. It's going for 99000 And what I heard over the radio was that somebody said, well, he earns about 1500 a month, and therefore he or she would be unable to earn or to, be, uh, to own one of those things. And I think here we are clearly. Maybe the targeting was wrong. It wasn't meant for those people. And maybe that also raises another point. Why do we call it affordable? Affordable is subjective. Subjective to a certain income group. If you are beyond the band, you cannot, in fact, you, are not, you can't go close to it. So we are putting up houses. They are affordable to a certain group. But as I said, targeting is extremely important. Targeting the right socioeconomic group so they can have access to those buildings is extremely important. But thus far, we haven't done too well on that. Prof, you said that affordable is relative, but in the mind of ordinary person, I expect my leaders, you know, after voting for a political party, having a government, I will expect the government to plan for the ordinary person. So ordinary person interpretation of affordability is that whether I'm a tomato a seller Stella. or a farmer, this country must plan for me that with my cassava, tomato, yes. classroom teacher, I can afford, uh, say, a bedroom, a two-bedroom yeah. for myself. Yeah. So whatever relative it is, for ordinary person, affordability must mean affordability. Well, I, I, I agree with you. Um, if you're talking about majority of the people, that is right. When you say affordability, I think what we've done is that you can do the housing planning, you can do everything. But ultimately, the person you're interested in or targeting should have access to it. Now, you raise another very interesting point. Government. What business does government have to provide housing? I think our institutions should be strengthened and they should create the appropriate environment for the private investors to take up these housing units, the construction and eventually the selling of these units. When you go to Accra, you see a lot of estate agents, a lot of gated communities are developing. And government has very little to do with that. All they do is make sure that the environment is right. Uh, the institutions that are providing finance should be there. So if you need to access finance, you, should, you can access finance. But it's not government's... We are not living in a social environment, uh, well, social uh, democratic... Well, they say it's a, uh, social democracy. But generally, government is not the one to go out doling completed houses. Let government... Government has no business to do that business. So let government know a government knows and that they will create the appropriate environment, the right institutions will now begin to work, and those interested in investing in the sector can then invest so that ultimately these housing units will become available. As we speak now, depending on where, who you read and what you read, our housing deficit is about 2 million units, and I'm not sure if government is going to be able to provide all these units over either the short, medium term, or perhaps in the long term, but as I said, it's not, it shouldn't be government's business to provide all these houses. Let us create the environment. Let us make credit available. Uh, so, for example, you should be able to get the mortgage, live in the house, and gradually what you do will be to own it. Prof, I'm becoming worried with some of the statements you've made. It's like those who earn 1500 2000 can never afford a, 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 a house and accommodation because the gated communities, estate development, they don't plan for those who earn thousand five hundred, and the mortgage, the thousand five hundred, two thousand salary earners cannot go there. So it's like if government doesn't plan for such group, and we leave uh -huh. uh, the the estate developers, then some of our people, and maybe majority of our people, may never be able to uh, 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 acquire. Decent housing. Okay, but that, 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 is, that is where I think uh, your, your, your perception is not right. I'm talking primarily about household income. So it's you, the guy, your wife, the kids, if anybody, any of them is working, and then you top this out with mortgage if it becomes necessary. So therefore, the ta if you look around, if you go to Ayimensa, uh, Damfire and so on, they are low-cost houses. They call them low-cost housing. 
um, less than about 200,000, you could get a house. But maybe our taste is also such that we don't want to live in those houses. Look, when you were young and you were building, I'm sure you thought about four bedroom house, five bedroom house, one for a guest and so on. Right now, you don't have the need for those things. Your kids may have left home and you are there with your wife. You only use one bedroom. So what we are saying is that let's cut down, let's curtail our taste to what we can afford. And that's all. And let government also target us in the planning. So in the planning, we are going to talk about each of the income groups. The, if you would, the low income, the middle income, and then the um, upper, upper middle income. That's all. So as for Trasaco and the high end of the market, that is not what we're interested in. We're interested in the lower end of the market and those in the middle. So targeting would be important. Let the institutions work. Let's cut down our taste. Let's talk about household income rather than just the income of the head of the household. Prof, you said very important that we must revisit our taste and cut certain things. And I want you to look straight into this camera and talk to ordinary Ghanaians who feel that they must build some of the buildings you are talking about that seriously they may not need. Just look straight into this camera and talk to my viewers. We may not know who is watching us. All right. I think what I said was that Perhaps we need to be more realistic and cut down on our taste. Here we are, our wants are limitless, but we have real needs. So let's look at those real needs and forget about the wants. The real, means, uh, the real needs means that we have a house and the house has a function to perform, it provides accommodation and it should be a home for a family. That is what I'm talking about. I don't think that we should get to the high end. Getting to the high end we're very expensive, eventually it won't serve our purpose, but let, let's learn to live within our means. And that's what the message I'm giving to the viewers. This is what is next. And I'm in conversation with Professor Kwasikwa Fuadakwa, and he's admonishing that we must revisit uh, our text, that people must live within their means. There are things that we are focusing on that seriously do not benefit, but they come with stress and frustrations that can be avoided. But Prof, it seems the increasing urbanization and the growth of urban areas and cities have become major challenges for local government, policy makers, and urban planners. But does the challenge confronting us also offer us any opportunities? Absolutely. I think what you need to note is that for us to develop economically, or for us to generate local economic development, or national economic development, we need urbanization. It's, if, if, you, if you read any basic text, that is the assumption. And it's true. We need the urbanization simply because when you have large areas, you have tend to have large markets. The industries that come there can also come in group, and they have what we call agglom uh, agglomeration economies, agglomeration of scales, and so on. So what happens is that they would be able to cover their, 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 their administrative costs, and so on. And so we need urbanization for us to develop. But in our case, what has happened is that perhaps it's been so rapid over a very short time, and therefore, again, we're unable to perhaps think of how to manage the process properly. I know of some countries where they virtually, physically, erected barriers to stop people from moving into the urban area, but that would never work. And so what we need to do is to look at both ends, the source area, the origin, the rural area and the urban area and to begin to look at what we can do to the rural area, in the rural areas to perhaps reduce the rate at which people migrate and in the urban areas once they come to that destination what do we do to help them have a comfortable life and so to answer your question directly yes urbanization is important for economic development throughout the whole world if you look at countries that have developed they have a very small proportion of people who live in the rural areas. And what it means is that because of the advantages offered by technology, they're able to produce to feed those who work in the urban areas. And those in the urban areas too, they add more value to our GDP. And therefore, if they have been in the rural area, perhaps it would have been very difficult. And therefore, for GDP increases, economic growth, local economic development and so on, we need urbanization. But in addition, we need to be able to manage the process properly. Prof, the impact of climate change as a developmental issue is gaining considerable attention 
due to the difficulties most inhabitants are facing. But it's like we still want to live our life in such a way that we can create environmental and climate problems today and expect our children to come and solve them in the future. I don't know your impression about this issue. Yeah, I think that, um, let's first, I would like to make something extremely, very clear. One, you spoke about climate change. For us, when we talk about climate change, we're talking about excessive heat, excessive and unreliable rainfall. We're talking about flooding and so on and so forth. As you and I know, any of these three or four phenomena or these issues, they deepen poverty in the sense that if climate changes, or you're a farmer, you're not able to realize your proceeds, what you estimated, then you're going to be poorer. If the, the onset of the rain is, or the, is, is, for example, is delayed, you're also going to be poorer. And therefore, there's a direct link between the climate change and poverty reduction. Now, what we are doing is that we are asking everybody to mainstream poverty reduction and climate change into their activities. Each of the various metropolitan, municipal, and district assemblies. This is so because if we don't do that, then as we said, we are going to live our lives as though our kids will come and solve the problem for us, but we need to tackle them on headlong. And therefore, from a planning point of view, we can talk about adaptation, how people can adapt to the climate change. In other words, within their circumstances, how do they pursue the activities and at the same time be able to live as though or minimize the effect of climate change. The change has come, it's a permanent thing, and therefore we need to look at them. What it means is that we have to tackle the problems head on. Our kids, we are not creating problems for our kids to solve. If you do that, you are perhaps an irresponsible person. And in the whole country, throughout the country, I don't think anybody will want to do that. And therefore, now that we have climate change, as I mentioned, uh, flooding is on the increase. We also have rainfall. The quantity and has also reduced. It's also unreliable. We have a lot of flooding and so on and so forth. We have created the problems and we need to solve them. We shouldn't think that perhaps after this generation, the next generation will come and solve this problem for us. And therefore, we also see planning being able to help in this direction. And so in most of our cities, together with NANBO and some of the other organizations, we've been able to determine which areas are liable to flooding. But you and I know, when we've determined these areas, you'll see people going against the recommendations and developing there. We've said that don't develop under high tension lines, but everywhere in the country, people are developing under grid coal lines. It's not good. So again, our institutions should be up and doing. But go back to your, going back to your question, there's a lot of linkage between poverty reduction and climate change. And by our planning efforts, our intention is to reduce poverty. And to reduce poverty, we also have another problem to deal with. That's climate change. So climate change can be handled or tackled with a view to reducing poverty. That is where we are now, and that is the way most people are now beginning to reflect on climate change and poverty. Prof, we are one of, we are a member of the Institute of Planners, and one of the functions of that association is advocacy. Exactly. Now, if you look at how we are handling our water bodies, farmland, mm -hmm. how cyanide and mercury yeah. are finding their way there into the soil, and it's been told that it takes more than 20 years. Are you worried as a planner? I'm very worried. Again, it's not peculiar to Ghana, but I think us, we, we have gone really overboard. I remember that in graduate school, we were told that in a lot of places where employment was very high, you tell somebody that, look, what you are doing is going to cause environmental hazard. They say, well, it's between my employment and the hazard. You deal with the hazard, I'll deal with my work. But naturally, that's not the, that, is not, that shouldn't be the attitude. And therefore, we are worried. The increasingly, we are compromising the environmental uh, restrictions or requirements for a lot of uh, something, maybe that, something you call the pitters. And we think that that is not right. And as an institution or the professional associations I belong to, we are all concerned about this. I think the education hasn't gone too far. And as an institution too, we need to lobby we need to do advocacy. In a lot of other places, you have people walking the corridors of power and they do the advocacy, they are paid for it. So perhaps it's about time that we also have people in parliament or walking the corridors of power advocating for what needs to be done. We've talked 
we've talked, we've written, and we've written. People read, but they can't be bothered. And so what we need to do is to go a stage further to say that, look, the talking is enough. Now let's do lobbying or let's, doing, let's do advocacy to see whether that will also help us. But naturally, as a member of the professional associations, I'm very worried about what we see with respect to the environment. And, and will you expect the Institute of Planners, your group, to do what you are calling for, that they get people who now will not only write, who will only talk, but now go to the corridors of power and do real advocacy, lobbying? Uh, is that what you are calling I think for? so. Um, just this weekend, we at the uh, board meeting of the Land Use and Spatial Planning Authority. Um, I chair that board. And one of the things I saw the CEO bring to the board is that next year he wants to employ um, an officer who will deal with their various publics, or what we call the PRO. I thought it was a very good initiative because, look, we know the solutions to our problems. We've done the planning. We've written reports several times. And the impact is minimal, minimal. And therefore, we need to have somebody around like that who would engage the public from radio station to radio station, from TV station to TV station, so the education can go deep. And therefore, our level of sensitivity would be enhanced. But I think that it's something in the right direction. It shouldn't be just the planners. All the various interest groups, those related to mining and so on and so forth, they should all, we should all have lobbies working the corridors of power to make sure that our needs are addressed. This is what is next on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. And I'm in conversation with Professor Kwesikwa for Adakwa on sustainable planning and national development. And he is saying that we know the answers to our problem. Maybe now we've reached a point where the will to do what ought to be done must seriously be considered. We should not create problem uh, today and expect our children to come and solve them tomorrow. Prof, is there anything in planning that we can identify and name sustainable transportation? Yes, um, I think let me go back quickly to give you an idea of what we mean by sustainability. I think by sustainability, what we are referring to is that for those of us living now, we should be able to meet our needs and requirements, uh, but we are not going to compromise the requirements or the needs of future generations. And therefore, when you talk about sustainable transport, we're looking at a situation where the current transportation or the transportation system will serve our needs now and in the future. Unfortunately for us, we are not there yet, and we have, I think we are even wrong. We don't even seem to understand it. If you look at any typical traffic stream, in other words, if you look at a kilometer long of roads in Accra, Kumasi, or anywhere, you see that small vehicles, private cars, and taxis, they make up about 60 to 65% of the stream, and they take a lot of space. I don't remember the last time I saw a public bus, a passenger bus in Accra or in Kumasi. What it means is that if we continue this way, using private cars. And look, the private cars have very low occupancies. Uh, maybe I'm there with my wife and our little kid or our little grandkid. You're there, you're not married, but you still want to drive to work. So the vehicles are many, the small vehicles are many, and we all demand fuel. And therefore, if we go this way, and by the way, the, in Kumasi, for example, the rate of growth of vehicles, it's about 3.5%. That's, that's higher. Already in Ghana, we have less than 2 million vehicles. And yet, we can't we can, we can, we can cope with them. And therefore, what I'm suggesting is that perhaps instead of concentrating more on the use of private cars, let's begin to look at the mass means of transportation. Those are sustainable. In other words, you have a bus that will t take about 60, 62 people. It will mop up about 15 to up to 20 vehicles. There will be space. The use on, on our, on our uh, fuel requirements will be Will be, will be minimized, and that is what we call sustainable. I know that you are aware that in Accra, we tried the Ayalolo, mm -hmm. and because of some misunderstanding with the other transport organizations, it didn't go too well. But that is the way to go. If we are not careful, very soon, the situation is going to get so bad that nobody will be able to move his or her vehicle 
over even a distance of say five kilometers. It would just be impossible. When I was a young boy here in Accra in Kumasi, what we saw was that from in Kumasi, from the university to the post office, it was a distance of what six, seven kilometers. It took about 15 minutes. Now the same distance, you need about 45 minutes plus. So what is happening? You can imagine that five years from now, it may take you about one and a half hours to go. This is what I mean. And therefore, it's important that we look at sustainable transport properly. That is the way to go. Otherwise, very soon, we probably would buy very high value vehicles, but we cannot use them. Interesting. But bro, inequalities is a reality in our society today. In fact, the gap between the rich and the poor keep widening in education, health, housing. How do we respond to the inequalities in our societies today in terms of planning? Okay. I think that, as I said, most of the programs and projects over the last many years have focused on poverty reduction. It's important to know that this is even mainstream into our curriculum. In other words, whatever we do, we want to minimize equality as much as possible. And the norm is that let's look for a situation where inequality is zero. In other words, everybody is on the same level. But that is not also natural because of our different capabilities. And therefore, what we do is that we try and push the current level of inequality, depress it. In other words, to reduce inequality. This is what we've done so far. And I'm sure you've heard about the fact that in Ghana, we've been able to reduce poverty. But at the same time, what is worrying is that the gap between the rich and the poor is also widening. Uh, this is worrying. And I think it's about time for us now to begin looking at how we can bridge the gap again. Uh, so far, we've done well, and poverty may have reduced. But inequality is widening, and that is where our concern will be. But I think that if you look at our recent initiative, in other words, if you look at the free SHS, I think that it could be a game changer in future. Because now, wherever you attend SHS, whether you go to attend a school in Bonkrugu, Gambaga, Zulezu, wherever, there is now an opportunity for all of us to attend the university. It shouldn't be the preserve of some schools only. All of us should now be able to go. And I think that you're also aware that education is one particular feature that will tend to reduce inequalities. If you educate one person from one small community and the person graduates, say, in pharmacy or medicine, you could see the impact that such a person could have on the community. And so I believe that the recent initiative, that is the Free SHS, could be a game changer in helping us reduce inequality. But some years ago, a child in a school under a tree in a village, anywhere, any part of the country, could find uh, uh, admission in Achimota, Prempem, Fansapem, and and move on to the university for some of the competitive programs. Yeah. But Prof, uh, from where I stand, today it is like if you are in a certain disadvantaged environment, even though you talk about the free SHS, depending on where you are, it's that you must accept your pride. It's difficult to penetrate. Uh, with respect, I tend to disagree with you. I think if anything at all, these days we are seeing a situation where what you just described is probably going to be a thing of the past. I teach the 17 year olds in the year one and you'll be amazed at the schools they come from. Uh, there's a particular school I want to suggest, uh, Admas, Eduman Secondary School. People are coming from, they come from almost everywhere. And so I think that, contrary to your expectation, I think now, gradually, the playing field is being leveled and people from any of those schools can now come to any of the universities and go to some of the most favored programs. And so that is my view. Uh, and I, I think that to a very large extent, I'm right. Yes, and, and this is KNUSC, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. And we have heard that some years ago, this university initiated a program uh, specifically even for some of the, let me Le call it less advantage, endowed, yeah. less endowed right. schools. I don't know if uh, KNUSC has been able to sustain that program uh, just to uh, provide 
a, a, a kind of, uh, you know, a, a leverage, a playing field for such uh, less than that. I don't know whether that program is still running or yes. now you close that chapter. No, we can't, we can't do that. What we've done is that that program is still running. And during my time, for example, we're giving a quota to some of the surrounding villages. I uh, moved it up from two to three. And I think that has been improved recently. So I think that we cannot simply abort that initiative. It's very useful whether we have the free SHS or not. This would cater for your con the concern you raised earlier on. If for some reason your location offers you a disadvantage, then this will seem to bring you in all the same. And therefore, that is why I think that education should be looked at, or the free, free SHS should be looked at very well, because I think it will be a game changer. Let me repeat what I said earlier, that if, for example, you have a young man coming from a village, a village called Mamidede, close to Samam, and the person comes to medical school at KNUSD, following his graduation, he would have substantial impact on virtually everybody in the village. And that is why we need to continue getting those kids to come to school. I'm sure you've heard about the fact that we have difficulty in the posting of doctors and so on and so forth. We're hoping that through these initiatives, we we'll now be able to have a lot more of them going back at least to serve in the areas for a while. If you're a pharmacist and you, reduce, you refuse to go and serve in your community or close by, then you've not been faithful, you've not kept your faith with the community. And so gradually, we're seeing this coming on live stream. And whether we are free SHS or not, I think the program that brought in kids from the less endowed schools should be continued. And indeed, I'm happy to know that KNUSC is still continuing that initiative. But is this something that can go beyond KNUSC and become even within the bigger planning of, of those of you managing academic institution that the less endowed specifically must have certain space in at that level? Or is this is KNUSD vision oh, and it no. means KNUSD? No. I think I'm also happy to know that in some of the other old universities, they still, or some of them have also em em embraced this particular uh, policy, and they are doing that. And I think that from the point of view of planning, we could do this, but we are not going to have so many of them getting into some of the more favorable or more favored or the favorably destined schools. I'm saying this because I've seen people move from Navrongo to attend Achimata School. People have come from Bimbila to Infantsman and so on and so forth. And therefore, I think that planning can still do this. Educational planning can help. But it's not going to be, it's not going to be substantial or wholesale. What we'll do is that let's pick those kids who are from these less endowed areas, less endowed schools. If they are gifted and they are bright, we need to encourage them so they can go to attend some of these schools and come to the university to make sure that poverty in those areas are also reduced. Well, universities are supposed to lead the development agenda of the nation by designing programs capable of producing critical thinkers and innovators to manage natural resources for development. But there is some impression of disconnection between and among government, industry, and the academy. Do you have that impression? Well, I think it's, it's, it's been flagged for a long time. And I think that in most cases, it's probably over, also over-exaggerated. What is happening is that at KNUSC, for example, if you want to change or modify your curriculum, we demand that you bring evidence from consultation with industry. And I think that once we can do that, it goes a very long way to do that. Now look at previously, we had what we call manpower planning. In other words, the people in the ministry will sit down and say that this year we expect a total of so many people from each of these schools, or in future, we're going to need these skills. And therefore, universities introduce these programs. When, you, when we did that, in about a matter of four years, they know that they are coming out from school and they have destinations for them to go to. But for some reason, that connection appears to be lost. And therefore, what is happening now is that we are simply playing to the needs of the market. And therefore, people are wanting to enroll in some of the most favorable programs. Most favorable means that most popular programs. They have ready market, and therefore, they would normally go to their medical school, they would go to pharmacy, and so on and so forth. That is where they think the, the, the market would give them an opportunity to work. And so, it's important that we have this, this connection between the academia, 
between industry and between government. Now, as I said, all of us are working together, but at times we tend to over exaggerate. And I think that the investors have also reacted favorably. And that is why when you come to KNUSC, for example, you see that we've introduced some or many of the market driven programs here. Other investors you can afford to do the class. But this is a matter of policy, a matter of policy. And I think that it's up to us to say that maybe in the few years to come, if you are moving into the sciences, if you are moving into where the, the society has needs for, perhaps we could cushion you. But if you want to go and do your liberal arts and do whatever you want, you can go to the university. But perhaps you may not be able to obtain a scholarship to do that. This is a policy that I think can come. And I think that we need the support of industry. We need the support of government and academia would also have to come in. Once we have academia, then perhaps we can begin to look at this favorably, begin to plan for them. And I think that over the short term, we should be able to respond to some of these concerns. But remember that we don't have to exaggerate any of these. They are realities. Okay, so let's plan them out the way they are and don't let us go ahead wanting to exaggerate to feel, to make some people feel bad. There's a notion that um Students coming from our universities are not flexible. They are not able to think outside the box and therefore become unemployed after graduation. Is it a problem of the students? Is it a problem of the market? Is it a problem of the academy? Those of you nurturing the students. I think that as that's also related to the first question. Um, I'm yet to see any institution that will train you and pick you straight from the classroom to industry and you fit in any position given to you. This may not happen. But what we are saying we, we, we do here is that because we consult with industry on a number of occasions on these things, what we expect to happen is that we'll be able to satisfy their needs up to a certain point. But when you go to the industry, remember, you also need to pursue some training. You need to be trained. And so we are not looking to see a perfect situation where you jump from the classroom, go to industry, become the general manager, and be able to work the machines and so on. That is not what we are looking at. And so it's also a bit unfair for industry to expect that this will happen to the graduates from this university. Of course, there is also the situation where you have kids who go to industry, they can't even string one sentence together. That is also there. They write minutes for you, and the minutes are useless. That is also there. But we're saying that generally, what we see is that the kids here are trained very well. They know what to expect in industry. And so if you say they don't think, they can't think out of the box, perhaps it is not true. If you come into a professional program at KNUSD, what you expect or what you do after graduation is what you are taught. If you do architecture, you move from the classroom and you go to industry. If you do planning, you move from the classroom to industry and it should fit. Within a matter of years, you can gain a lot more experience and become more functional. And incidentally, it's the same people who are telling us that the kids we are training don't fit. So I think that we are doing well and we need to be encouraged. But agree, again, we can do a lot better. So there's still room for improvement. improvement. Prof, you are not only academic, you are also a Christian leader and you have, uh, you've been playing very uh, uh, influential uh, roles in uh, Christian circles. Should our churches do, what should we do differently in, in closing the gap between uh, the rich and the poor? The, the issue you raised earlier on. What should churches be doing knowing that our country, in fact, if you bring Christian Muslim together, we are very religious. What role should faith-based organization play in closing the gap between the rich and the poor? I think that, again, for the faith-based organizations, we should continue our partnership with government. You know, we've been very successful in education, but I'm looking at a situation where we are going to move from education into our various neighborhoods, our various districts, and begin to tackle some of the issues we raise, environmental degradation, for example. All, virtually all our drains are clogged with plastic material. What can the churches do to alleviate the situation in partnership with government. And so I think that if we are leaving the scripture, then 
perhaps we should apply it a lot more or we should be told uh, we should be taught a lot more at church and i want to see the church take a leadership role in this and for us to go to the assemblies just as we did with the schools and say come we need to partner you to begin to solve some of these environmental problems if you go to the north the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, for example, they are tackling climate change. They are helping the women adapt to the changes that are occurring, that are happening now. And I think that is what I, we should do. We should leave the scriptures. It should be very practical. It shouldn't be only on Sundays. And I think a way out would be for us to go to the assemblies, partner with them, and let's begin to see how best we can solve some of our environmental problems. Prof, you are a former vice chancellor of Kwame Nkrumah University of Science technology, one of the leading universities, not only in Ghana, but in the sub-region. Has ethics and ethical leadership been seriously considered in the formation of our next generation of ideas? Yes, we've done this, but I think it's very slow. Uh, let me go back quickly. A few years ago, what we thought we could do was to introduce courses in ethics. Ethics because we think that most of these kids before they leave school, they should be able to tell, they should be able to decide whether what they are doing is right or wrong. If you go into an office and somebody slips an envelope to you because he wants a favor from you, you should know that that is wrong. And so we, had, we thought we could introduce this uh, course, particular course, at the KMUSC for virtually all students. And so what has happened since then is that I've seen some programs on the KMUSC campus. Uh, making it mandatory for the kids to do the ethics. I think it's uh, important. And closely related to the ethics would be issues of morality. Now, morality is dead. Okay? And therefore, for most of our students, they don't even know that what they're doing is wrong. So I think it's about time for us to go tackle this problem head on. We need to tackle them so that at least, in addition to some of the mandatory courses they do, this would also be added, either in the third year or perhaps in the fourth year. So they know that, look, we've been taught this way, but going out into the field, a lot of things can happen. And if they do happen, this should be my values. So far, very little has been done. And I'm happy to know that KNUC has begun introducing some of these programs for some kids in selected programs. Prof, your last word to my viewers. Well, my last words are that as a nation, or perhaps let's start with the individual. As individuals, let's begin to plan. As households, let's begin to plan. As families, let's plan. As districts, let's plan. And as a whole nation, let's give planning a chance. Without planning, our future can be compromised. This is what is next. What is next? is a very educative program on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. And I've been in conversation with Professor Kwesi Kwafo Adakwa, former Vice Chancellor of KNUST, and we've been reflecting on strategic planning and national development. And he is saying that let us go back and plan. And planning is not only for government, but individuals, families, districts, churches, all of us, Plan. Medi Araba clean, me pao che wu. Sa wu kwa bebi su ba. Wu ho huro wansa. Wu kwe di agro wia. Wu ho huro wansa. Na wu se san wu ba no napi. Ana dae pes nu wye nswe. Wu di wansa tu o yon kon sem. E chi anu wia. Wu ho huro. Enti e ya. Wu ho huro wansa ye pa an sana wanwa we bi ane. Ana ansu wu be didi. Wu ho huro wansa. And sa yen ho huru yen no mo amọ wan kitin kiti a yen fa yen ni ehun won e be sise ho sa bo amọ wei etumi kwa hye wadua ni mu a etumi di yade ebrew sa wudi aduane a sa gems yi adore mu a wo betumi anya cholera ene diarrhea fa same na ho huru won sa ho huru no wato nsu a enso ni yo ase ho huru won sa yam ene wo ma wiri mu won sa chi won sa dua ene wabakon kai na ho huru won sa ye Abra wako ejanan bia so aba wako di agro awie ansa na obenua aduane ansa na obedidi na empo wachia chia nkrofo awie no kai na ohro won sayi enie na ma wei enye usuban ohro won sa bra no bra no me ho nte enye kama na enya ho den this is 
what is next? On GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. And for some time now, we've been reflecting on the subject strategic planning and nation building. My guest in the conversation has been Professor Kwesi Kwafo Adav Kwa. We have had wonderful insight from him, but we must sign up, we must stop somewhere. You may be aware, I told you that today's uh, What is Next came to you from the Department of Planning, a department delivering excellent planning education. But Prof, what is your last word for my viewers? As we've just discussed, uh, things don't happen by chance. And therefore, as individuals, as households, as families, as neighborhoods, as townships and as districts and together as a nation, we all need to plan. Without planning, we may be doomed. We may compromise our future. Viewers, thank you very much. We'll come your way same time, same time next week. Till then, God bless our homeland, Ghana, and make this country great and strong.